Hi, and welcome to the audience. My name is Jonathan Atkinson. Uh, I think I'm going to start off by thanking the symposium organizing committee and all those involved for putting together such a fantastic platform. I really am honored and privileged to, to be able to present to you today. I'm going to keep it very brief and, and focus on the application of the, the concept of geodiversity. All additional material or associated concepts should be included um, in the accompanying notes that I'm sure will be, will, will be distributed um, throughout the talks or, or after the talks. Um, as the title suggests, we're looking at geodiversity and primarily how to quantify it and how to characterize it in a, in a district municipality in the KwaZulu-Natal district of Utugela. So what do we mean by geodiversity? What we are looking at is we are trying to understand the diversity of the abiotic components of the landscape and predominantly occupied by the sort of geological or geomorphological features, um, the pedological or soil components, um, and even the hydrological components. And how do these different components or assemblages actually contribute to the overall landscape uh, characteristics? Uh, there has been much debate around what uh, the term can mean to uh, different uh, fears of study or different avenues of study. But in this context, that's the, the definition we've adopted. We've taken it one step further in terms of the, the quantification. And we, we also consider geodiversity to be a numerical expression of these landscape features. This obviously then opens up uh, a wealth of opportunity for us to start applying models, statistical models, mathematical models, and more importantly, um, application of, of geovisualization to, to view these areas of, of geodiversity. Again, it's, it's, you know, there's been much resistance or, or, or lack of uptake of the concept because it can actually vary from a, a particular area. We could look at the intrinsic value of geodiversity, the cultural value of geodiversity. We could look at the functional perspective of geodiversity or purely the economic perspective of geodiversity. But in, in this study, these are the two definitions we've, we've adopted. So why do we need to quantify geodiversity? Well, there's a large body of, of evidence that suggests that areas of high geodiversity have been shown to be highly resistant to degrading conditions and just better equipped to, to deal with pressures such as climate change um, related components. Um, compared to low geodiversity areas. And in much of the historical approaches to geodiversity have been limited to qualitative expert-based systems. And obviously that prevents us from applying these models or these concepts to, to other areas um, at scale. And, and also it prevents us from objectively applying different sort of platforms, uh, you know, statistical geovisualization platforms. So the key, the key focus of this study is to, to move towards a system that is you know, sort of automated or semi-automated, but more importantly, provides a harmonized platform of which to compare areas of, of diversity across uh, an area like a municipality, for instance, or even a province. You know, secondly, it, what's also quite interesting is that not much work has been done in South Africa, in fact, uh, around quantifying geodiversity in the manner in which we've done. So this, this pr presents a real novel uh, perspective of, of one proposed uh, methodology of how to do it. And, you know, we, we, are, we need, considering where, where we're heading in terms of uh, the pressures of climate change and, and future uh, limitations on productivity and landscape um, availability, we need novel approaches that can sort of you know, readily quantify or evaluate the benefits and the trade-offs of different land use decisions at, at different scales. And obviously this would lead to a, a better holistic uh, application of, of sustainable land management practices. We focused our research objectives on three primary um, outcomes. And the first was to actively apply a GIS methodology to the assessment of geodiversity adapted primarily at a regional scale, but with the intention of hopefully upscaling it or even disaggregating it to a lower level sort of local municipality or even a smaller ward level if, if necessary, depending on the scale of the data. Secondly, we defined uh, the geodiversity index, which we titled GDIX, by the diversity of partial indices or partial landscape diversity factors, which we'll address uh, in the coming slides. And, and how do these linkages 
feed into the, the, the overall geodiversity index. And finally, how do these all connect to sort of the land use planning coverages that are, are readily available and used uh, currently as strategic land use planning tools? So those are the three objectives that we, we set out to, to investigate. We decided to focus our efforts on the Utsugela district municipality simply for two reasons. Firstly, we had done some prior work in this, this area and any it was anticipated that any geodiversity related uh, assertions that were made could, could readily be then compared to, to previous study outcomes. For instance, uh, soil classification or hydrological assessments, uh, issues around degradation and so on. So the idea was to use this municipality, but also because it, it offers a real eclectic and diverse um, set of, of landscape parameters for us. If we look at the Drakensberg on the western region, um, moving towards the lower lying coastal area on the east, um, it really presents a, a, a very diverse set of uh, landscape features to evaluate. The right hand map then segregates the, the area into the basically the starting point of how we quantify the diversity. We overlay a grid uh, pattern and the grid uh, resolution is a 2.5 by 2.5 kilometer uh, resolution. And this forms the extraction base for, for how we're going to extract the various um, partial diversity indices and ultimately lead up to the diversity calculation. The final geodiversity index values that are obtained are the summation of seven partial index components, which itself are then derived from 12 subpartial components. And very simply, the components are meant to encompass the range of diversity that we would expect to measure within an area. So for instance, we, we consider the hydrographic component, which accounts for uh, the water uh, water contributions to diversity. We look at the geology or the lithostratigraphic component. We factor in the soil component or the pedological component. We look at the climatic index, uh, which caters for variability in rainfall and, and temperature. We then look at how the landscape is derived in terms of its ruggedness or complexity, which accounts for the topographic index or topographic diversity. Uh, we look at landform features and, and landform richness, richness in the form of geomorphometric um, indices. And then we, we combine that with, with something that's quite new as well, even internationally, is we look at it from uh, the insulation as opposed to just looking at aspect, we consider the solar morphometric index. And again, these are quite important. Um, you know, these are derived at particular scales. The indices are derived at particular resolutions. And more importantly, they are derived for a particular purpose. For instance, we, like I said, we, we want to look at the variability in base flow and stream flow because we, just, we agree that these two components would account for hydrographic diversity. If we look at geological richness and geological sensitivity, we agree that these two components would account for lithological diversity and so on. So the model is very simplistic in the way it's designed and how it's meant to be applied, but very effective nonetheless. One of the major challenges in trying to quantify geodiversity on a grid-based system in terms of, of abundance and, and richness across different data sets is figuring out how to do so by not under or overestimating um, elements of diversity uh, or double counting or undercounting for that matter. And we spent we spent some time um, in perfecting this approach and we effectively developed a system whereby within each 6.25 square kilometer grid, it's 2.5 by 2.5 kilometers. Uh, we, we effectively not only created unique identifiers for each landscape feature, but we then exploded and then dissolved on these unique features, which, which again is very rudimentary, but again, very effective. If we just look at how this fares to an explosion example, whereby we explode every feature within a grid and then count it, that's just going to give us a lot of redundant information or, or areas of it, it, counting information which is not true to to what we are trying to achieve. Similarly, with with the raster-based data sets, you know we're dealing with spatial resolutions that are finer than the the 6.25 square kilometer resolution of the extraction grid. 
So developing a unified or single value or parameter for that was, was again, quite challenging. And we opted for uh, applying a zonal statistic based on the mode value within a grid cell, which obviously then translated into a really useful and, and usable single value that could be used for, for calculations. The final geodiversity product, uh, the grid-based product, is, as mentioned before, the summation of the seven partial indices that have all been normalized to zero and, and one, and all contain the same grid resolution of 2.5. And effectively, then using a raster calculator approach, we derive the final geodiversity grid map. This, however, is, is not a pragmatic uh, model output to use for, for comparing across landscape features or other land uh, resource data sets. So we apply a cridging or interpolative approach to, to generate a smooth model, which allows us to effectively uh, explore the relationship between other uh, sort of land land resource products. The findings of the geodiversity index overlay with the, the landscape resources data sets presented some really exciting results. And I think two of the, the results that I'd like to, to um, focus on, which seem to provide some consistent outputs, is that of the land cover and that of the biomes, which both highlighted that areas of high geodiversity uh, coincide with, with grassland biomes and, and natural grassland areas. And again, this is this is quite encouraging, considering that these areas are under major threat um, from a land use perspective, but also that you know even across different data sets, whether it be land cover or whether it be uh, looking at eco ecosystem status or protection status, the geodiversity was consistently detecting the the need that or the the fact that these areas have display high high geodiversity. Um, also, quite interestingly. Uh, if we consider uh, from, a, from an agricultural agronomic perspective and we look at land capability, we also see that areas of, of moderate to moderate high land capability were regularly being detected as having high to, to medium geodiversity. And again, that adds an extra, uh, extra element of, of protection to those areas if necessary, given that they, they might have high uh, agronomic value, but then they also have high landscape and abiotic uh, functional value as well. Right, so what's the way forward for geodiversity assessment in South Africa? Well, again, we need to acknowledge that there's not going to be any singular perspective of geodiversity quantification or representation, just given the broad spectrum of definitions that, that apply to it, each equally important and equally relevant. Um, secondly, this obviously limits us from understanding um, how to apply it and how to validate it across the landscape if these studies are so few and far between. And again, that was a caveat of the present study. Um, since there was no prior work done in the region, it provides very little uh, scope in which to compare or to, to tweak the models and to um, improve on them. So limitations around that would need to uh, be addressed, uh, obviously opening up the, the research to, to broader areas, which is what we'll be exploring and, and going forward. Some of the improvements that I see uh, geodiversity quantification benefiting from, uh, I'm going to focus on the last one, uh, which is the use of the grid-based system, which has been an internationally adopted system. But I see some major gains by shifting away from regular square grids to something like hexagonal grids um, uh, rather than fishnet grids, simply because um, the, the geometry of a hexagon uh, offers uh, competitive advantages over reduced edge effects and also provides a lower perimeter area ratio for, for any tasseled sample. So that obviously allows us to, to include a much richer picture of, of diversity within the grid cell. I'm going to end it there. Uh, as I mentioned before, um, there's, there's going to be additional content in the accompanied uh, notes, but I, I definitely want to, want, want to give thanks and, and, and acknowledge my supervisors, Professor Willem de Klerk and Dr. Andre Rosanoff, I want to also personally uh, thank, thank Kevin Zunkel um, and Dr. Boyd Escott, uh, both of whom have been quite, uh, quite key to some of the, the concepts that we've addressed in the, in the presentation. Thank you for your time, um, and please feel free to contact me for, for any additional information or, or any assistance or any future research. Thank you very much.